Welcome to part two of our podcast series, Reimagining Jury Trials, How Virtual Trials Can Proceed. My name is Alan Howard, and I'm joined by my colleague in the Commercial Litigation Group in the New York office of Perkins Coie, Ed Baum, and Perkins Coie's trial consultant, Karen Lisko. Karen, as you may recall, holds a doctorate in legal communication, and she has been taking a lead role nationally since the start of the pandemic to figure out ways to make virtual trials work during the pandemic, and perhaps even after the pandemic is over. We will also include during this episode discussions with Judge Pamela Gates, the chief civil judge in Maricopa County, Arizona, who has been instrumental in the Jury Trial Innovation Task Force. In our first episode, we covered the current landscape of jury trials and strategic and practical implications for clients engaged in ongoing litigation. In this episode, we're going to explore the virtual trial experience from the juror perspective. And I have to ask first, Karen, how are we able to do that? Well, we've had a pretty amazing look into remote jurors because in two different groups, we've run some very extensive remote jury trials, mock, but they were actual jurors. They were jury eligible. They came from prior jury pools and they were willing participants in letting us try on for size from start to finish, soup to nuts, an entire trial with them. So we did a few of them both through the Online Courtroom Project, which is the national group with which I'm affiliated that studies all kinds of ways of doing jury trials during the pandemic. And then also as an advisor to the Judiciary in the Arizona Trial Innovation Group. So when we did that research, you start to see patterns. And we asked jurors about every single phase of their experience to find out what they liked, what they didn't, how they felt, what was their fear, all of those things, and got a really robust amount of feedback. So what were some of the headlines? What were the big takeaways? And then we can get more granular. Well, the fun surprise was the level of engagement jurors self-reported. They said that they found it easy to to concentrate, easy to watch what was going on. They did have a few issues with, especially in the remote setting, with the surroundings, especially if they were in the comfort of their own home. So we had uh, at least one juror who we caught looking at his email because he had two monitors, one where he was looking straight ahead at the trial and then a few times off to the side. And I asked him point blank in the interview afterwards what he was up to, and he confessed that he was checking his email. Now, it's also possible, as we all know, that in the real trial setting, in a courtroom setting, Jurors can also check their phone or they can surreptitiously, if they've got an Apple Watch or a smartwatch, check their watch. So it can happen, but certainly you have a a 360 view of a juror in a jury box. You don't have a 360 view of a juror in a remote trial. You know, Karen, I know I've read any number of times over the years about studies that postulate that in the current era, people are more accustomed to receiving information from a screen than in a live setting. Have you seen that phenomenon replicating itself in the context of speaking to a remote jury? Yes. And we've been studying that for a very long time. You know, I did my doctoral research. It's been over 30 years ago now, but I used the video medium when I was studying credibility by video of attorneys in the courtroom and of witnesses in the courtroom, again, by video. So it's something that other social scientists and I have been looking at for a very long time. Obviously, the big difference here is it's not like there's variety. It's not like there is an in-person setting happening and occasionally they watch a day in the life video or they watch an animation of something, but instead it's all video. So one concern all of us have, and we should, is, is there a point at which through a Zoom jury trial, jurors start to get complacent in paying attention? Because it's novel at first, of course, and therefore engaging. But now the job of the litigants and the judge and everybody is, how do we keep that level of engagement going once jurors get adept at watching the same screen day in and day out? You know, it's interesting because Alan and I will be um, doing an arbitration hearing probably in a hybrid setting in January. And when we were scheduling the arbitration, the arbitrator who's done several virtual hearings 
told us he did not want to do more than four or five hours per day because of Zoom fatigue. And he felt that no one, including himself, can maintain concentration beyond four or five hours staring at a screen. I got to believe, though, you also get efficiencies when you have a Zoom setting in the sense that we're all familiar with the with the the protocols in an in-person jury, you know, rising, the jury's got to go out. And there are times when you're going to have sidebars with the court, with, with the judge and breaks take longer to get everybody back. You have admonitions, time waiting for witnesses. And that could, you know, be cut down and it could become a more efficient process for the lawyers, but also for the jurors. There was a Zoom jury trial in Alameda County, California, just several weeks ago that lasted nine weeks, if you can believe it. And if I'm not mistaken, the lead trial attorney for the defense told me that each trial day was roughly five to five and a half hours long because of this very true thing, which is Zoom fatigue. So the jurors had access, by the way, in that setting, they were each sent a laptop or delivered a laptop that only had the one platform on it. And it was the court platform. Now, they could have, of course, had another device nearby, look things up, etc. But they all had the same kind of physical hardware. So that was one of the goals. But the other part of it was trying to make sure that they could keep their attention going. So I believe they had a number of breaks. And that does, be, you know, like you said, you have to get the jurors to come back to the courtroom. You also have to get them to come back from the kitchen. So sometimes they lose track of time. They're not quite as organized as they are when they've got the bailiff there or somebody who's who's shepherding them back from the jury deliberation room. But again, jurors, they, people get mechanisms going. You know, they put up timers and say, look at the screen, jurors, this is your countdown timer and how much time you have left on your break. So there's adaptation for that. So here's an experience I, I I th- I'm sure everybody who's tried a number of cases has had. It's fetching the juror out of the bathroom. Um, <laughs> you know, you, everybody's ready to go, and there's, you know, juror number three is missing, and you got to find the properly gendered clerk or somebody else to go track them down and get them. It, it's, it's one thing to do that when you're in a courthouse. Have you seen that phenomenon yet in any of your jury trial experiments? And what are we going to do when juror number three is not there? Put another camera or a buzzer in their bathroom? That is so funny you bring that up. Yes, people have thought ahead about that because when we did the Arizona simulation, we did have a random juror or two who would go absent. And so the clerk already had the cell phone number for the juror and another way besides yelling through the screen, (laughs) where are you? And so they, they had a pretty seamless way of getting the juror back. But there have been instances where the cell phone was right next to the laptop where the juror was participating in the trial. So there were there have been occasional hiccups and delays, to be sure. So, Karen, you started by mentioning high level that jurors in the mock jury setting, the ones who've had the occasion interview, told you that they were able to stay engaged. Should they give you any details as to how, in particular, their attention was able to be kept? Well, a big part of it was how immediate everyone was on the screen. So instead of this large space between the jury box and the witness stand or the jury box and the podium where the attorney is, they felt like people were literally in their living room. And it's it's what we all experience in video conferences. It's where there is that intimacy that can happen where you can actually have good connectedness. Everybody's facing forward. People are looking at one another for the most part. But the interesting addition to that that none of us had accounted for was jurors were watching each other watch the trial. And more to the point, they were watching each other during jury selection because they're all on the screen. And the good news was after we interviewed jurors saying, how did you feel about that? Did you think it affected your candor? All but one juror told us in one of our studies that they felt they could be more candid during jury selection because they felt more at ease and more comfortable. But there was one juror who said, I didn't like that everybody was looking at me when I gave my answers. So she felt like she might have held back a little bit. And she had been a prior juror in the past in in an actual courtroom. And she said there, 
Nobody's looking at me. They're all facing forward. Only the attorneys and the judge are looking at me. But I felt nervous because of that. But again, she was one exception out of everybody else who said, I felt like I was just in my living room talking and the attorneys were really disarming. They asked me good questions. The judge was so friendly by Zoom. And we did have that in both of our experiments. We had exceptional actual judges who were going through the voir dire with them. So setting that tone made a huge difference. Okay. So, so Karen, you mentioned that the jurors got a feel for one another by seeing each other on the screen. But does that really take the place of the bonding that can uh, be built uh, among jurors in person? I have to say that's a big concern. Because I'm sure in your jury trial experience, you've seen jurors show up in the same color one day, or they brought cookies for one another in another day. And they had so much waiting time while things were getting started in the morning while they were in the jury deliberation room that they were able to learn a lot about each other, their families, their likes, their dislikes. And that kind of bonding comes through during jury deliberations. Now, If you think about it, that could cut both ways. You know, a bonded jury may be closer to a more unanimous jury, which arguably in a civil case could feel like a happier instance for a plaintiff who's trying to get that sense. But we don't really find that just because a juror is bonded, it means that their verdict is unanimous. It's just that they have an easier time actually talking with one another and even sometimes disagreeing with one another because they've gotten comfortable. So one of the judges, Judge Gates, who is part of this podcast, is especially alert to it. And she told me something interesting. And she said, you know, We've got a remedy in a way we can put jurors in a breakout room if it's a video platform. But when it is right now in an actual trial in the courtroom, we cannot let jurors sit together inside a jury deliberation room and have social distancing work. So she's actually more concerned about bonding in in in-person trials these days. And her remedy for that was pretty clever, which is that part of the jurors would go into the jury deliberation room. The leftover jurors, so to speak, would be in the hallway nearby, but she always wanted to make sure she mixed it up. So she was contemplating that they would, at some points, mix in different combinations. So it wasn't like three people sitting in a chair in a hallway bonded and the other six in a jury of nine were in the deliberation room and they were bonding without the other three. So She's alert to it. I'm sure that replicates reality of other judges as well in other jurisdictions. But she just recently told me about that. And I thought that is something we haven't really considered in terms of the in-person setting. Well, I hate to throw cold water on what sounds like a great idea. And we are at best lawyers and not public health experts. But I suspect the public health experts would be concerned about mixing and matching the jurors. I think the recommendation would be to keep them in the same pods (laughs) <laughs> minimize cross exposure. And and I'd hate to throw cold water on the judge's idea of, of breakout rooms in terms of creating some bonds among the jurors. But you know, one of the major concerns during jury trials is that the jurors will disregard the admonition given to them by the judge of not talking about the substance of the case until the time of deliberations. And that's why you get some of these crazy stories where after the trial, the jurors will ask you questions like, what car do you drive? I'm thinking in particular of an L.A. jury, uh, because that's what they talk about in the jury room is they try to guess what cars the, the attorneys drive or they'll come up with nicknames for the attorneys. That's what I was going to say. More nicknames than anything else. They they check your socks. They yeah, talk about I, I, your attire. I, I, I would hate to tell you some of the nicknames I heard for myself. But anyway... The fact is, though, you don't want them talking about the case, and I can't imagine there would be an occasion to put them in a breakout room, particularly for the purpose of talking about nicknames for the attorneys. So it really would would mostly, in a, in a purely virtual setting, be you know just an experience, uh, an individual experience for each juror. I, you know, and I suppose it happens on occasion, but... My experience talking to jurors over the years, to the extent they've been honest with me after actual trials when I interview them is, they tend to shepherd each other. 
you know, somebody starts to talk about the case and other people say, nope. Don't, we're not supposed to do that. Don't talk about the case. So it's a it's a risk whether it's an in person trial in the jury deliberation room or if it's a Zoom trial in the breakout room. I mean, either way, it's it's you're counting on your ability to trust those jurors. One of my concerns in a Zoom setting is I now have a choice to go in the breakout room or to my kitchen. So where do you think I'm going to go? You know, and when you're in an in-person trial, you don't have your kitchen right there. So you tend to cluster with your fellow jurors more. And that's what's going to be a difference. There's more distractions and opportunities around your house. So that could sometimes get in the way of jury bonding. Well, how does the, how does the judge handle, for example, what in person would be a sidebar. Yes. All right. So there are separate rooms for the sidebar. So there's the main room, which is the courtroom. There is a second room, but sometimes that requires in certain platforms, the attorneys have a second device. So one of the projects that I was was on, I was also serving as a trial consultant to one of the sides and a colleague of mine was acting as trial consultant to the other side. And so we went into breakout rooms of our own. So now we had, uh, this was a civil case. So we had a plaintiff's breakout room. We had a defendant's breakout room. We had the judge's chambers, which was another breakout room. And we had the jury breakout room and the presentation room. So the, the court personnel had figured it out. They figured out how to make all of those available. But we had to, just because that was a unique platform at the time, log in through a separate device to go into one of the breakout rooms. I will tell you it's been corrected, though. There are now court connect kind of platforms that have figured out how to tailor a video platform specifically for a virtual jury trial. So while, for example, the lawyers are with the judge in chambers, the chambers breakout room to to address an objection or, or some other issue, but it's not going to be long enough to send the jurors out on a break to their kitchen and they remain <laughs> in the main room uh, without the lawyers and without the judge. I, I guess there's there's a court officer who are, who remains on, on the Zoom to, to monitor to make sure nothing untoward is happening? Right. And the court officer can mute all lines. So if they're not on a break, then they are not talking to one another because they can't. So, you know, implicit in this entire discussion is an assumption that communication between jurors during the course of a trial and juror bonding is actually beneficial. True. And I think an argument could be made that, in effect, having each juror function as an independent silo during the taking of evidence would be preferable, that each completely develop an independent perception of the case, and then they would first begin deliberating fresh, so to speak. Possibly. I mean, I, it, a lot of it comes down to also looking at juror dynamics. I love that you're raising this because this goes above and beyond remote versus in-person, pandemic versus not. And one of the things that is profoundly true about jury discussions is that a more diverse jury usually comes to better decisions. So, and it, it could follow from your theory that if you have independently mindful jurors who have not overlapped much with one another to the point of deliberations, there possibly could be more diversity of thought. But diversity also relates to diversity of culture, religion, gender, all of that, because we are influenced, obviously, by our background experiences. And the more diversity there is, again, the better decisions, the more thoroughly jurors tend to discuss the evidence and the rest. Yeah, and I guess a related or a simple question would be when you're doing jury selection, often you, you you tend to focus on whether a particular juror might be a leader or a follower and uh, how, how that dynamic may work. And curious to, to find out whether those attributes would hold true in a remote setting. Well... Uh, we call them consensus jurors and conflict jurors. And depending on which side you're on, you want one kind or the other. So obviously in jury selection, you're still trying to figure out how not only who do you think the leaders are, but how do you think the dynamic will be as a group? So anytime I'm assisting in jury selection, I'm thinking hard about that. I'm thinking, I'm trying to guess who do I think the other side is worried about? Who are they likely to strike? 
Who are we likely to strike? Who's left and therefore our jury? And how does their dynamic look? And, and to whose benefit does that inure? But I will tell you one very important thing that's happening in the remote jury selection setting that we social scientists have been clamoring for for years. And that is that a number of jurisdictions have just smoothly moved into doing supplemental juror questionnaires. So they're case specific, they're detailed, and now they're doing them online in an effort to try to shorten the oral voir dire time. And certainly when they were thinking about, you know, for those doing in-person jury trials, they were trying to limit those who had to show up in court. So it had the double goal of helping the attorneys and the judge on cause challenges and peremptories, but also helping on hardship. And therefore, not as many people had to get involved. But you still have bandwidth issues for a Zoom jury trial because you only have so many squares. So you also have to do jury selection in pockets for that as well. But here's what's cool and why we've been clamoring for this so much. I have to tell you, there's a very forward thinking judge who's since passed away named Judge Bilby. He was a state court judge in Tucson, became a federal judge, and he was so jury friendly that he would go and do jury selection by taking off his robe, going into the well, turning his chair around and just straddling his chair and having a conversation with the jury. And he did his own study a long time ago and found in his research that jurors were 10 times more candid in a written juror questionnaire than they were in open court, even though he was a friendly judge. And he was right. And so the fact that we've been fighting for years in both federal court and state court to say, please let us have a written juror questionnaire so we truly can get at bias and what jurors' true experiences are, the the accelerated inevitability has come through this pandemic as I, I'd call it a gift wrapped in barbed wire of the fact that now it seems it will get a bit more mainstream to do these online juror questionnaires. That's going to help everybody. And that's something I would imagine will survive long after the pandemic is over. I, I sure hope so. It's the right thing. Are there other lessons that you've learned from jurors when they report to you their experience in the virtual setting that we could use to apply after the pandemic, either in continuing some element of jury trials being held virtually, or even when we go back in person to improve the experience for jurors? Boy, that's a great question. I, a part of it is the attorney's manner with the jurors, starting with jury selection and, of course, going through the rest of trial, whether it's because Zoom just feels more immediate and therefore more intimate, jurors keep focusing on the warmth factor of the attorney. It's, it's of course, the competence of the attorney, but it it feels like, think about when you watch a movie and you feel like that favorite actor of yours could be your friend. There's something with that screen experience that should translate to the live courtroom too. But I have certainly encountered attorneys who have said, oh, I've got to be professional. And being personable is going to detract from that. And I will say forever and a day, the most effective advocate is the one who is both professional and personable and who gives herself permission to be that way. And that's what we're hearing from the jurors. They're, in a in a weird way, it's like they've been able to pinpoint that better themselves in the, in the virtual trial experience because that person's face is front and center and they've got, they speak with more specificity and giving feedback about the attorney's style than I've ever seen in the virtual trial by saying, you know, I saw his expression or she was so patient in listening to that juror's answer during jury selection. We really appreciated that about her. So it's, it's interesting that that's something that's become more clear in how jurors express what they appreciate about attorney advocacy. So let's talk a bit about what's behind that advocate's face. I mean, right now we're in our respective home offices. Uh, you can see what I've got back there, including my bicycle. Obviously, <laughs> I wouldn't have that there if I was trying a case from this seat. But what is the most effective background to have behind the lawyer to 
create that combination of professional and personable that you're you're referencing? Well, first of all, you're assuming there's a choice because in some jurisdictions, you don't get one. The court will give you a background, so to speak. So, let's and it won't start. be Shea Stadium. Ed. It won't be Shea Stadium. It won't be. We're now City Field. There won't be palm trees. I'm sorry to tell you, but that let's assume one of two scenarios to answer that. The first scenario is you are lent a background that usually looks like a courtroom setting. The critical, critical thing to do there is to make sure that you as an advocate have purchased a green screen. We've, you know, you see them in certain studios, but now you can buy them and they attach to your chair. So that if you have a virtual background, you're not disappearing into it or pixelating into it like we've all experienced when we watch somebody using a virtual background during a regular meeting. But if you get a choice, then the best possible thing, as boring as it sounds, is a blank wall. No pictures, no books, no flowers, just the most monochromatic background you can have so that you are the main visual aid. So it's critical that the attorney look at the view of themselves through the lens of how do I make sure that I am the main focus here and I don't have anything in the background. And of course, as many have learned the hard way, you never want a window behind you because it can cast your face in shadow. So I could go on and on about the lighting and the other things in terms of camera angle and the like, but background is keep it simple. And if it's a virtual background given you by the court, get a green screen. So Karen, you you talked about some of the challenges of jury bonding and went right to to the obvious question of whether that would impact deliberations. From the exercises in which you've been involved and your observations of the actual remote trials that have occurred, is there a sense that the quality of deliberations has suffered in any way or changed in any way? Nope. And I'm, I'm so fast to say that for this reason. I've had an opportunity in, in terms of if art imitates life of being part of hundreds of mock trials over the years. And when we do mock trials, we are watching through closed circuit video, the jury deliberations. So those are when the jurors are at a conference center or a hotel conference room or something. And so they're in person for that. And the level of engagement in that setting is immense, even though that some of them suspect that they're being watched live. Then we've now moved to online mock jury deliberations, of course, this year. And I have seen zero difference. Jurors in online mock trials bicker, fight, hold their ground, pout, talk over each other, uh, shake evidence at each other. I, there is such passion in how <laughs> online mock jurors deliberate, paralleled by the passion they have when they're in person, that I feel very comfortable saying, I suspect there would not be a difference when it was an actual online jury deliberation. Any loss of civility from the remote format? Actually, there's more turn-taking. That is one difference. So I would say the opposite. Uh, you can tell, obviously, when, let's say there it's an eight-person jury and you've got eight evenly spaced squares in a gallery view on a screen, you can tell pretty easily when someone is not quite done or about to finish. Now, of course, some may say they don't care if a person is still speaking, if they're angry enough to disagree. But it seems like there's more turn-taking going on in the Zoom setting versus when you may just have somebody around that jury deliberation table in person and they're in your peripheral vision, but you haven't really caught that they're trying to get a word in edgewise. How have uh, jurors handled evidence in deliberations in a um, remote setting? If you've been part of a video deposition, it's pretty similar. You have a file folder available to you. And the way I've seen it done is the court at the point of deliberations, if it's really rustic in terms of a platform, can just put the exhibits in a chat. So there's a link for each of the exhibits there. In the more sophisticated courtroom specific platforms that have started and are are starting to get even more and more sophisticated. They've got a separate window with a file folder and the jury, at a minimum, the jury four person can access it, but certainly 
I'm sure it's going to become possible that every juror can access it. And that may even be the case in some of the other jurisdictions where this is much more common. So that way, anybody can click on it and look at it. And that way, or somebody else can click on it, share their screen and say, look, look at this paragraph. Here's what I'm talking about. So it gives the jurors the ability to uh, have some a way at least of trying to zero in on something specific in an exhibit that everybody's looking at at once. Have you seen any alterations in some of those core practices of interaction between jurors and the court during deliberation, such as requests for readbacks or the ritual, and it varies from court to court, of jurors having to request specific exhibits as opposed to the old tradition of just putting the exhibits in the jury room. I mean, from an advocate's point of view, those are some of the most agonizing moments because you, you hear a jury request for a readback or or you know the jury wants to see a certain exhibit and everybody tries to read those tea leaves. And, and occasionally that agony produces uh, settlements or resolutions of the cases. Each side tries to read something into what the jury is focusing on. Have those practices been altered materially in the virtual context? Well, I'm going to make a supposition about it because I haven't had that experience, but I have to believe there may be less back and forth about that, at least for exhibits, if they have access to all of them themselves. Of course, when you talk about the readback, that is where they still would have the ability to ask for it. So as long as they've been instructed well enough to know that they're really not left to their own devices, then I would think that that could still continue. I, I just wonder if jurors might not sometimes feel a bit more isolated when they're in their own home, even though they see each other on the screen, they don't feel as proximate to the jury, the judge or the bailiff. So I think they would have to be admonished better at, or instructed, I mean, better before they deliberate to say, look, we're available to you. If you need X, Y, or Z, here's how you find us. So that there's some access point for that. Uh, I will tell you though, tangentially something fascinating that um, some judges have reported to me about jury questions during trial. You know, and as you know, many jurisdictions invite jurors to handwrite questions out, hand them in after the witness has testified and everybody huddles around the question and decides whether or not the question can be answered. A few of the judges told me that since they've gone into virtual jury trials, the questions have exploded in number because they're using a private chat feature. So now they just type the question as it occurs to them. It's immediate. They get it. Now, of course, it goes to the judge. It's not like they're putting it in a public chat of some kind. So only the judge sees it, vets the question, and then goes into the breakout room with the attorneys to determine how or whether to handle and address the question. But the judge I spoke with most recently about it said she was blown away by how many more questions there were in the Zoom jury trial setting. Well, again, that's only natural because people have been Zooming and whatever else for nine, ten months now. We all got used to using the chat, so why not chat the judge? Exactly. But that also shows a high level of engagement. You know, the virtual environment could stimulate. Right. And, you know, I want to speak to that, too, because I could see a risk where jurors have you know, th again, think about the virtual jury trial. You've got the attorneys taking up some of the screen, the judge, the jurors. We sometimes overread anyone, juror or otherwise, as how they look when they aren't speaking. So think about a muted jury watching you as you give your argument. And we all are guilty of overreading that juror who looks completely checked out or completely bored. When in fact, I've always said for years, you know, we take courses in public speaking. We don't take courses in public listening. So we don't think our face has a job to do. And that's true for jurors as well. So one warning label I would give if this moves forward, especially to attorneys, is to not worry so much about what juror number three is doing or not doing or whether juror number four is engaged or not just based on how they appear. The one cue we will lose, if the jurors are all on mute while the testimony is being taken, we won't pick up the snoring juror, which is often <laughs> given. 
<laughs> well, and I will tell you, when in one of our mocks that we did in the socially distanced trial, one of those jurors fell asleep. And I remember there were a couple of judges watching and not besides the judge who was presiding. And one of the judges turned to us and said, this is just like a real trial. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume, though, too, that on the Zoom setting, you know, we're very uh, used to large trial teams because you're generally trying some large, complex cases. And one of the things you need to do in trial preparation is with your own team and the people on your team is to advise them what to do and what not to do while sitting at counsel table because jury's eyes may be on them even if they're not examining a witness. I assume in the virtual setting, the other team members are not on screen. Is that a fair assumption? I know that's an option, and I suspect it could vary by judge as well. But the ones that I've been involved in, yes, there were a number of us who were just a black box. So our initials showed up. Of course, if it was where your counsel of rec record, there's no reason just your initials are there, but it could show your full name. But there had to be strategic decisions made about who was peer appearing by video and who was not. So that does get a little dicier when you've got multiple parties in a case in terms of how to make that work. But like everything else, I'm sure that challenge will be met. Yeah, well, it, it is a consideration because also in these larger cases, we want more than one lawyer from the team to bond with the jury. And we often will split up witnesses and whatnot. And you want each member of the team who's going to be talking to the jurors to have that connection. If only one advocate is on the screen most of the time, the others will necessarily appear secondary and right. may not have as, as deep a relationship. That's going to have an true. impact. But uh, they, you know, for the same reason, we like to allocate witnesses and, and opportunities for, in our case, younger lawyers to, to participate substantively in the trial. And we find that juries really respond well to that. They appreciate that they, they don't want to hear just one voice and they see the other team members sitting there and they appreciate seeing them take an active role. I would imagine that would hold true and even more so in the virtual setting because they'd be get tired of looking at our faces and listening to our voices and to <laughs> see fresh, fresh faces and fresh voices throughout the trial would increase the or uh, improve the experience for the jurors. Not to mention seeing diverse faces as opposed to just the typical graying lead trial counsel. Well, and, you know, I think we're going to talk about this more in the third part of this podcast. Part of the decision point is what, where do you as the litigator want to try to have some influence over screen view, over the, the time, especially at the beginning of the trial, where in fact you do want your entire trial team to be visible for more than just a moment to the perspective or actual jurors. So some of this is not just being reactive to what the judge is saying, but also trying to have a voice in influencing things exactly like you're talking about. How do you make sure that there is literally more face time for more people on your team? So, so often an important consideration in trials is who's going to be our client representative for those of us who represent corporate clients. And it's very important often to select somebody who will be a positive face of the company that will appeal to the jury. How do we accommodate that in the virtual setting? That's a fair question because we grappled with that both in the virtual setting when we did our research and in the in-person setting because the client representative was not allowed to sit at counsel table because of social distancing. And the attorney, let me talk about the live setting just to compare it. In the live setting, when we interviewed the attorneys after that process, they lamented the fact that they couldn't even have a paralegal next to them, second chair next to them, and of course, the client representative next to them. And because it was the live setting, everybody was wearing masks anyway. So it was, it was tough for everybody to see reactions and even to communicate a little bit in terms of how that went. Now, I will say though, ironically, when I was part of the federal, I was part of a federal court case last month that was in person. 
And we did socially distance, but it was such a massive courtroom that there was room literally at council table for a couple of us. And we had two council tables. So that's not always the case, as you know, especially in smaller courtrooms, often in state court. Um, so we had the gift of that bigger space in federal court. But even then, it was hard to talk with one another. The jurors couldn't see the client representative's reaction, the opposing counsel's reaction when the other counsel said something obstreperous. You know, so some of the drama goes away in the in person masked setting, which is why, ironically, when we then tested exactly the same case a few weeks later in the remote setting, there was some relief because nobody had to wear a mask, people were more immediate, but we also had to figure out who would be on the screen. And corporate representative, as you know, if it's a corporation, or client representative, plaintiff, whoever it is, is somebody very important to a jury. Jurors have great peripheral vision, even in an in-person trial. So if they're on the screen, you can be sure jurors are going to be watching them watch the attorneys or watch that other witness who's testifying. But not all the courts, in my experience, have figured that out yet because they've been very careful to limit the screen views to the advocates and the witness, for example, when a, an attorney is questioning that witness. So that's, again, something that could influence the process from the advocate perspective in thinking, well, who do we want on our side of the case and the other side? Who do we want the jury view to include? So we talked about jurors not being able to fully bond because they, they're they not able to speak one-on-one -on -one or even in a group setting other than potentially in a breakout room. And the only way I imagine that they can bond with or have any sense of relationship with the lawyers is hearing us speak and certainly in the voir dire setting. But for client reps and for others on the trial teams who are not going to have a speaking role, the only way they're going to have any sense of them is if, if they're allowed to be on screen. Correct, because if they're not on screen, the only time the juror might experience them is if they testify. But there is so much energy that jurors put into taking in everybody in the courtroom. Even if they look like they're not necessarily interested, they're still watching you react to opposing counsel. They're still watching the client representative watch opposing counsel or another witness. So some of that drama could dissipate in the remote setting. So for our guests, you just missed a little incident we had here in our discussion, which was uh, our dear friend Alan was speaking and had not taken himself off mute. And that reminds me of a low tech lesson I learned in a virtual hearing a few months ago. We were schmoozing with the clerk waiting for the judge to come online. And uh, the clerk reminded us all to be mindful of our mute button and know when to take it off. And uh, somehow we got to talking and the clerk held up for us a sign that she had that said unmute. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and she said, that's how she would do it because she said, every day I have to use this a half dozen times. And she holds up the sign on the screen so the lawyer can see that they're on mute. That's so funny. High tech I tool. Yeah, I was talking to a with a panel of judges just yesterday, and one of the judges said something very similar. She said, the most common phrase now I hear from attorneys is, sorry, judge, I was on mute. And Alan's on mute again. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Karen, one of the other things that comes to mind from what you were saying is in every case from large stakes, corporate, you know, commercial disputes to you know, episodes of Judge Judy, one of the fascinating aspects is to watch one party react to the testimony of another party when they're directly at odds. And since so much of a trial is an assessment of credibility by the jurors, if they can't get that full experience, how are they going to fully be able to assess credibility? That's a thinker. I think that's part of why, if you know that's an important element you want to protect in your case, that's where the advocate should be trying to influence the process and the view. Because that may not have occurred to some judges who are just at the beginning of this. You know, they're thinking often very literally about whoever has a speaking role, of course, 
is on the screen. But there may well be good argument to make that it shouldn't just be limited to those with a speaking role. I guess the big issue is you want to replicate as much as you can the in-person environment while also taking advantage of some of the benefits you've described, especially from the juror experience perspective, the virtual environment. And that also leads to ways in which the advocates, we as trial lawyers, can improve our performance by the experience from the virtual environment in the ways we connect with jurors. And that will be discussed, among other things, in part three of our series.